Yeah. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the. Hmm, I don't know how many of Olava Talks this is. It's uh, the, an Olava Talks with Amal Al Haq. Hi. Yes. Hello, hello. Thank you Hi. for inviting me. Well, wait, we'll get there. We'll wait. You don't know yet. You know what's going to uh, Olava Talks. I always start off with explaining a little bit what Olava Talks is. Olava Talks is a. It's an idea that I had about half a year ago, around January, um, about uh, being, basically, the last three, four years, I've been meeting a lot of amazing people, activists, thinkers, doers, makers, of all kinds of uh, walks of life, orientated in different kinds of communities, and I have, it has been such an instrumental part of my learning curve in the last three, four years. And every time I would be leaving from like a demonstration or in an organizing space or at dinner with someone, and I would have these conversations that were like literally life changing. And I would go home and realize that I had no documentation of it, mm -hmm. that I had no way to actually also show what it is that, it's, that happened, those moments, they became ephemeral and lost. So at some point I thought, wouldn't it be cool? to start documenting and archiving um, just the amazing work that people uh, that I'm meeting in this, in, this, in this activism world, in this creative world, um, in institutional world, these amazing people that are, that are inspiring me and teaching me, finding ways to, to document that, archive that, but also to showcase to, in general, to the public, how conversations are a very, very powerful medium and mode of knowledge production and knowledge transfer, right? And so I thought of doing it this way through the Olava Talks. And um, I've been inviting a bunch of people and uh, most of it happens a little bit like how it happened with you. We were, we were traveling back from uh, the Africa Dach, which was in, I don't remember that town. Bergendal. Um, Bergendal. And you had invited me to come and speak uh, to give a to give a a, to a reading of a piece that I had written for mm -hmm. Zwart, mm -hmm. and you had invited me, and we were traveling back. I think three hours, and in that train back, this woman like made me laugh so much, made me think so much. You were telling me stories about how, for example, how you landed the first time in Europe, like in the middle of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. being uh, dismantled and at the train station where people were a huge party you were telling me about your mom and how amazing your mom is uh, but you were also talking about because I remember in the train we were riding that week and that time I was very I was going through a lot of anxieties about the kinds of knowledge and the kind of legacies of resistance that we're losing that we're not that I feel like I have no access to that have taken place here on the continent here have taken place here in Europe in the Netherlands um, and feeling that it's inaccessible and you were teaching me like honey no people are people are documenting this stuff people and you talked about the work that you've done in the LGBT communities and in the black communities resistance documenting and bringing that up and talking about it and I remember I said could you please do a little have a talk with me because all the things you were saying were fucking gold. So that's why I invited you to a Talks. That is so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, in a way, I almost have to say that it was my colleague Rita and Ebisa who invited you. Yeah. And I was moderating the conversation. Yes, you were. That's yes. why I was And there. I came two hours late. That's, I mean, it was traffic, right? Yeah, it was sure, like the sure. NS that made you... Uh, yeah. <laughs> That that was actually the let's name, not the talk name about the NS. If let's, I tell you what they did to me yesterday, I was on the way from Amsterdam to De Rotterdam for four or five hours. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm not even gonna. But I met some of the coolest people I've met in many years. Yeah. In the train, getting That's stuck. Really cool. They were really. There was this one like a Ruben woman who's married to a Ghanaian man who works in Harlem, mm -hmm. and she's like about about to turn sixty. Wow. I died. <laughs> laughing she told me such amazing stories but we lost each other but it was yeah. anyways <laughs> there are good things from any sometimes um i asked you i know you work for the Tropa museum do i need to yeah. give you a whole cv of all things no, 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 i just no, heard no, you do a, a, a radio maybe that's something what, that we need to tell people yeah i, 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 I actually um do a radio show together with my friend jumande okay uh thomas and it's called africa's hot okay um, pun intended, and yes. it's on red light radio. Yeah. Um, infrequently, uh. um, irregularly. Well, it tend 
we tend to record it once a month. Okay. And then it's live streamed also on Facebook. I'm looking forward and to it. And you can it. check it out on redlightradio.net. Redlightradio.net. Yeah. What's your thing with African music? Tell me about. Um, I th well, I started out actually. Um, I used to be part of Together with Thomas mm -hmm. and Senemi Aburu, my friend, our friend actually, and Andrew Makinga. Um, we used to be part of the AfricanHipHop.com collective, okay. and that was like maybe early 2000s that we all, that we started out together. Thomas started it together with some South African friends, mm -hmm. and um, it was more at that time. It was really not so cool to be into African music, especially mm -hmm. not popular African music. Nope. And um, I guess it was also just not cool to be African <laughs> by default. <laughs> And, um, been a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean the come up is real. The <laughs> it's real. Um, I'm gonna ask whether that's because of Wakanda. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I already have the music in Wakanda is semi shit though. Really? I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so we used to actually throw um, these parties that were called mm -hmm. doing it in the park ten years ago, okay. and then 800 people sometimes would show up. Wow. People, majority people of color, black people. Oh. Um, that was 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh, we started it I think in 2000 yeah like started organizing Wait, were these live bands performances or sometimes yeah like we had Balochi for example from uh -huh. Belgium um, Belochi is a we had a oh yes finally he's been what around for doing? so long it's amazing it is amazing well, okay, I love fine. Balochi's work mm -hmm. um, and we even had ones like this wild circus party okay with it was, it's called Circus, but it's like Coupa de Calais. Oh, yeah. And it's just, um, we organized it in the Garden of the Tolhuis Town because that's where Selim and I used to work. Okay. And, um, it was but what I don't understand about, about Coupa de Calais Circus, is it, is it like a French, like a Parisian um, musical form, or is it actually rooted in I, the I, continent? I, I mean, it is, it is mostly from. Uh, it is continental, but it then is. there is such a strong relationship with like the um, African communities, the diaspora communities in Paris, mm -hmm. um, that it's like, you know, it's Abidjan, it's like all these cities. Yeah. I think it's more rooted in city culture. Okay. And that is connected then to Parisian diaspora communities. Okay. Um, and I, what I like about it is just the speed of the music mm -hmm. and the type of joy in it's the music. Really fun. And the parties are fun. And don't go to a coupe de. Just don't. I must say, I once once just went to um, like a um, proper African party with my friend uh, Denis, who's Congo from the little Congo, Congo okay. Brazzaville, and he's okay. Ukrainian, but he grew up in Congo uh, Brazzaville. And um, he took me to this party together with our other friend in Paris. That was 2004. Okay. And um, it was like. I've never seen that many wealthy Africans. Uh, <laughs> that's when you go like, wait a minute, I'm, like, I'm poor, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> why am I not allowed to sit here? And then they were like, uh, you uh, have to uh, get up for my chair, it costs uh, 5,000 euros, uh, yeah. uh, VIP. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> too proud yeah. for this place. Yeah, I have, I'm, uh, I'm living on like, uh, what, what we call in the Netherlands, like, you uh, know, a little piece of bread and hagelslag. Yeah. <laughs> I have had those, when I was, I lived in Rwanda, in Kigali for like about a year, in 2013, 2012-13, and yes, there are some very wealthy Africans out there. Yeah. And, um, it's, yeah. it's a different reality. It's a different reality indeed. Yeah. But I think also... Mostly people from Gabon, it was people like, there are some of their friends grew up mm -hmm. in Gabon, mm -hmm. and I think in that sense Paris is quite an interesting place because there's this intersection of different classes, of diaspora and African people, I mean, yeah. um, and at the same time, the wealth is present, mm. and not only amongst white people, but also very much amongst pe people of color, yeah. black people. And then coming from here, where just the display of wealth. I mean, not that I'm that in I'm not necessarily interested. I think it's interesting when you actually see it in a society so present. Mm. And I, in in that sense, Paris was just like a. Um, it has it has been very um, humbling. <laughs> no, not necessarily humbling. It's it's a place where you can actually see where the friction is mm. between different communities, but yeah. also um, the energy is different. Yeah. I mean, the parties over there, 
they're very like intense. Mm. I have to say, everyone um, is dancing, and at the same time, um, I found it more joyful there because somehow um, African music was just kind of. It wasn't like a special party where African music was being played. It was mm. actually by default the music that would come around yeah. in and out, um, and then everyone would know the songs. And you'd yeah. be like, "What?" Yeah, that's true. And everybody this knows what to do to the exactly. song. Exactly. Like, everybody <laughs> exactly. has like, yeah, get it. But I, I want to yeah. go back to this thing where you say like about frictions in yeah. different, in different African communities. And I think Paris for me, when the few times I've been there, it's always very marked and very pronounced mm -hmm. how you have some very serious. A divide, like divide along the lines of class yeah, among African true. peoples. Mm -hmm. So you have people who, you know, because France has been part of that sort of brain drain for a very long yeah, time in Africa, right? So, so yeah. selecting who's worthy to come. Mm -hmm. So kids from, uh, you know, privileged, you know, yeah. people, from, kids from NGO uh, directors, yeah. kids from ministers and so on, that get to come on like mm -hmm. visas, get to go to university yeah. in Europe, in France and so on, you know, live in the in the in the arrondissements yeah. and they, they're they're yeah. living, you know, they, they shop at like uh, <laughs> Charles Elysee, yeah. Louis Vuitton, they, yeah. they live that life. But yeah. you also have the migrant communities that are coming yeah. and ending up in the ghettos, the banlieues, yeah. who yeah. are you know, who are uh, doing you know, working predominantly illegally in the in the in the in the construction sector, mm -hmm. in the resto in the restaurants and and so on and or jobless or jobless yeah. Yeah. yeah and living on the streets and it's interesting how like these class divides mm -hmm. um are very like sort of because call, cities do that right so yeah. you bring people together and you yeah. it becomes very marked those yeah. differences and i wonder whether or not in terms of like this search for what is africanness and, and i think it's something that we are searching right like very much don't you think also on the continent musically as well yeah i, I mean I, I always say it reminds me of when people ask the question, what is art? And then I'm literally like, let's not waste our time on that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, but I, of course, people are trying to understand their own position because yeah. it is very much, um, it is hyper vis vis visible. And at the same time, it is something they need. When you're often so much questioned, mm -hmm. you almost need to be able to know where you position yourself. Yeah. Like, how do I stand for myself, or how do I speak for myself? Yeah. If I'm constantly dealing with the question marks, yeah. um, indirectly or directly, people are, I think, in a way, looking for it. But um, indeed, it is it is something people are dealing with. I and, do, right? Um, and I think, in a way, Paris also um, there are those extremities, and then there's a huge there are huge groups of people that are just in the mediocre every day, yeah. you know, just having exactly like you said, low paying jobs, but then raising children yeah. that might not be able to attend the right schools, mm. but are able to produce the new dances yeah, or, sure. you know, yeah. or, or find other means and ways of surviving. Yeah. If I look at some of my friends um, in Paris, there's a bit of everything. The one that the diplomat child with like three passports, mm -hmm. you know, and the people that literally have Congolese parents um, that became musicians mm -hmm. and actually do relatively okay, okay. okay and are helping raise Children. to raise their, the, their their brothers and sisters. And it's that type of but they move in different spaces. So you yeah. almost need to be a translator in order to yeah. um, translate also in class, but also in like inventiveness so in, in, it's it's yeah it's a complex thing i think i have to say that i guess maybe uh, i am very much concerned and i think a lot about these questions about africanness mm. and yeah. its extent its reach its depth its flexibility mm -hmm. i think about it and i think i think i have to be honest that that comes also with a particular positionality right mm -hmm. as a queer trans person yeah i think um i've been told often mm -hmm. that my identities and my behavior, because behavior isn't always identity, but yeah. least, um, especially in a Burundian context, yeah, yeah. but that, that I was that I was not African, yeah. and I found myself being put outside mm -hmm. of this idea of what is African, but also yeah. here of what is black, because yeah. you know um, I, I my gender identity doesn't fit into mm -hmm. these predominantly Western binaries, but still. Um, and that has found me really thinking about like what is blackness, what is Africanness, yeah. and, yeah. and and trying to yeah, find. Yeah, in that context, yeah. And so I look at, for example, you know, also the discussions. I was telling a little bit earlier about the discussions that I see happening in Burundi mm -hmm. about uh, ethnicities, 
and uh, and some people call them tribes or clans, but yeah. but you have ethnicities and you have uh, clans in Burundi, and um, and some of these ideas about what is African, mm -hmm. uh, what is black, have infiltrated our sort of have been absorbed and internalized by our very ideas about who's worthy, mm -hmm. right, and who's mm -hmm. closer, who's more proximate to say white uh, 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 white descendancy or something, mm -hmm. right? So you have or power. You know, or power. Mm -hmm. And you have these theories about, for example, Tutsis being people who, I think I've heard like that they're Jewish, sort of original Jewish people who became black and by moving down south, you know, so sort of, mm -hmm. yeah, and then that's sort of, and they, they, they trace it from Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Maasai, to oh, the, and, and the, that sort of, and the pearls, you know, that there's this yeah. idea of, if it's not Jewish, I've heard that we might be Egyptians, you know, oh, wow. who have, and that the, the yeah. local, the Hutus were more like uh, local communities, uh, mm -hmm. more related to the pygmies of, mm -hmm. of, of Congo, Congo is, uh, yeah. the Congo uh, forests and so on, jungles. I mean, these, these theories, and the thing is, I'm not sure whether they're our theories, yeah. Whether they are uh, ethnographic and anthropological, the white gaze, mm -hmm. and um, and I feel I don't know, maybe I'm missing it, but I feel like a lot of people are trying to figure out what is Africanness, yeah. how yeah. do we deal with you know our our what what you know white people have told us about mm -hmm. what African is, mm -hmm. uh, and what people have you know because in these churches, for example, I want to in these churches right now in Africa in Burundi that are paid for by Western churches. Mm -hmm. Where they're talking about whether or not being gay, whether being trans mm -hmm. is 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 African or not, Burundian or not, mm -hmm. they're all funded by Western churches. That's a bit of the, the Catholic Church yeah. brought this up as well, right? Has brought this mm -hmm. infiltrated this idea of who's a man, who's a woman, mm -hmm. what is sexual behavior, what is not, what is proper sexual behavior, mm -hmm. and it's really strange that it's morphed into being Burundian saying, yeah, but you're not Burundian because you, yeah. you know, it's. I find it very interesting because, in a way, I mean, I completely like this. These mythical stories, mm -hmm. um, um, you have them in Somali in the Somali community. Um, you have them in, in all over Africa, and specifically speaking as East Africans, in a way, you have it. It's very pre pre it's present yeah. across East Africa, and I been really. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about it because you are not only questioned. Um, by other Africans, but you're also questioned by white people. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, what we maybe need to dismantle is also the colonial administration, the structures that were put in place mm -hmm. in order to create racial categories. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and how that is um, very much, I think people, I think we really need to think about the afterlives of colonialism, mm -hmm. that we're living in the afterlives mm -hmm. of colonialism, and it's not necessarily over. Mm -hmm. It's still here, yeah. because you yeah, have these type of situations where um, churches on the continent, whether it is in Congo or in Burundi or in Ghana, are funded, or Uganda, mm -hmm. are funded by white wing, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, anti-black, yeah. um, super white supremacist churches yeah. um, and the missionary work I think we should not forget what type of damage the missionary work has done but also I think it's also time for Africans across mm -hmm. the continent that we must take responsibility okay. for also allowing for you know being sometimes it's, it's a complex situation in the sense that I think there is a responsibility for us to also engage to resist or to refuse mm -hmm. and those of us who feel that it's time to refuse to resist yeah. should like practice that yeah. a form of resistance because um, and, and at the same time re remember that we are the diaspora people so we should not reproduce the missionary work yeah. you know yeah. that is already there for a hundred plus year, yeah. uh, years and um, yeah, I've, been, I've been really it's it's such a um, dire Thing mm. because in a way it is the on one hand people are desiring the authentic African yeah. performing that if I look at Afropunk I, I can see the power of Afropunk in Paris specifically mm. of it being a meeting point where all types of people from the diaspora meet each other yeah. people that are deprived of seeing other black people that have African um, that are of African descent yeah. for example, and the joys in that and at the same time if I look at 
the way people are dressed, the way they're fashioning their Africanness, and what that what that reproduces. It's not far away from like the you know, Wakanda methodology. The, you know, I mean, it's not far away from how the ethnographic museum has constructed okay. the African. Yeah. Um, if you look at, for example, sometimes you see artists with their painted faces, mm. like you know the stripes, and I'm always thinking, when, where is that rooted in? Yeah. Like what particular African? Yeah. Um, culture yeah. has the painted faces yeah. and usually if they are there are not that many painted faces from my understanding of from what I know mm -hmm. but um, often it's part of a ceremony mm -hmm. a ritual it's it's not it's never out of context mm -hmm. you don't have like people walking in the streets or going to the market with painted faces no, no. yes it's I'm about religious to buy my rights, tomatoes for example, or, or, <laughs> my palm yeah. wine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then go around with your painted faces yeah. and I I, I think sometimes we also need to dismantle that, you know, yeah. because by dismantling do you think that that these concepts... Do you think that that is also a bit of cultural appropriation? Because I've heard... Um, I, I wonder if it is cultural appropriation. I, I think it's much more of a desire of to be in close proximity to one's African self. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily one's Somali self. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm speaking about ethnicity or cultural formation because mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily interested in the nationhood okay. because I think nations on the continent are problems. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, what can I ask you about that? <laughs> yeah. and, and we have border beefs all yeah, across. All time, yeah. As a Somali, I'm always like, hey, Ethiopia, uh, yeah. hey, Kenya, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Give us our life back, but then I'm also like, okay, it's what I find plus years. <laughs> what I find sort of about cultural formation and sort of yeah. these, because I mean, um, uh, yes, uh, whiteness is a construct, blackness mm -hmm. is a construct, doesn't make it any less real, obviously, no, it, <laughs> <very> real. <laughs> but there are constructs and Africanness, African hood and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and African culture, all that yeah. is, is quite constructed. What, what I find interesting, part of me sort of, what I find... Because so much of the world is invested, has mm -hmm. been invested in sort of creating and constructing what African hood and what African yeah. has. And a lot of it has involved silencing mm -hmm. actual African people in that yeah, process. Very much. And saying like, what y'all have to say is not really relevant mm -hmm. because you're, I don't know, you're too stupid or too mm -hmm. based to understand yourself. So yeah. we're going to mm -hmm. sort tell of tell you, what, tell you what you are yeah. and how it works and so on. I think NGOs and the, mm -hmm. you know, the post-colonial uh, apparatus yeah. has been also very much about it's like, this is what you need. Need, yeah. This is what you are, and so on. The nation, the yeah. nation-state project in, that you're seeing in Africa that causes so much havoc, mm -hmm. has been about uh, very much been sort of creating a particular kind of African hood and African mm -hmm. sort of uh, economy as well. Mm -hmm. right? like we're seeing a particular pattern of like sort of economy goes to government, government becomes sort of a yeah. business, you know, yeah. a mafia business. But anyways, and I sometimes part of me says like. Um, because we see in the queer community like reclaiming things like faggot and queer and trans and transvestite yeah. and reclaiming them being self-defining yeah. has been I feel like can be very interesting and yeah. I wonder whether or not as active participants mm -hmm. uh, because Afropunk for example has a particular kind of con they're constructing a particular kind of blackness and Africanness mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that is rooted in in, in, in anti-oppression right so yeah. they have like you know, this Afropunk, no transphobia, no yeah. racism, no whatever. But and no, ca there's no capitalism. That's the one that kills me. I'm yeah. like, really? Yeah. <laughs> really? Like, I see the whole list and I'm like, where's the no capitalism? <laughs> if you're trying to get rich, I have to still pay 100 euros when I'm going to Afropunk in Joburg. Yes. Oh, and, really? And, and I mean, in this sense, I think sometimes you also have to allow yourself to be a hypocrite in that I am very much like, because I believe often in dualities, things can be unhealthy for you or unproductive or oppressive. And at the same time, something within that yeah, can, yeah. you know, be like a, a seeding place or a place that yeah. sources your joy or a way to like revitalize or recharge yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and in that, I mean, Afropunk might be a, a, like, I see the power of it. Yeah. But I also see what it does to. Uh, there is there is a difference between reclaiming mm. what it does for I think for queer communities, yeah. and um, I'm still questioning like what it does for blackness okay. or black like mm. claiming. I'm very much I think in a way Pan Africanism has mm. been useful very yeah. much so, but 
we shouldn't think of it as something static. It should be something that should evolve and fit where we are in time and place. Okay. And, um, and in that, I think the concept of the African nurse yeah. or being African, we should always question it yeah. and m maybe like more, like make it fit into where we are currently mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, and um, in, in, in that sense, for example, what I was trying to say was that a lot of the Af the way Africans fashion themselves is rooted in the ethnographic mm -hmm. concept yeah. of the African, and the, with that I mean um, the photography, mm -hmm. like you know the colonial gaze in the photography. There is this one image where you see, for example, I think it's an Afar woman, okay. Afar live in Ethiopia, Somalia, mm -hmm. uh, Djibouti, um, and she's not she's on a um, like a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And she's wearing a skirt, but she's topless. Okay. So, and she's like really like looking like a cool, tough woman. Uh -huh. That image circulates on, on social media okay. all the time. People are reposting it as a something endearing, uh, as something empowering. Mm -hmm. But we also need to understand why was this photo taken yeah. in such a way yeah. in a particular cultural context, in mm -hmm. a colonial time? Mm -hmm. Why was she topless? Mm -hmm. Was the toplessness at that time the yeah. particular um, look? Or is she topless because there's a whole series of topless African women yeah. photographed by white European male photographers yeah. uh, in the colonial era? Mm -hmm. What does it mean also to, to have um, a black woman's body shown in a particular way yeah. in a colonial image? Yeah. And what does it do then if we reproduce it, assuming um, um, that that is how people dress? or not oh. and at the same time i know why people are reproducing because there's so little um imagery yeah there's so little in a time where image, visual culture is so important yeah. in the way we define and fashion ourselves yeah. there's a little imagery of what it means to be African. but what i wonder because i feel like I've, I've been i've been i was in the black archives i was working i, I did a, media, uh, uh, a talk with miguel Perez dos santos and we talked about how so the archives, and some of them are visual archives, right? And some of them are on the internet, and, and but some of them are in these kind of museums. Uh, these archives sort of make up of how we remember things and what we do remember. Mm -hmm. And I wonder when so much has been, so much has been erased, stolen, destroyed as well. A lot has been destroyed. destroyed yeah. And when so much has, you know, because the choices that indeed these photographers have made, who do they photograph and what kind of, you know, which sort of creates a particular, like a one-dimensional viewpoint, like from what the, what is happening, what was happening at the time, and I wonder how much of it when we're like excavating mm -hmm. those uh, and creating new images or rethinking, you know, past images and looking for more authentic. How much do we have to just come up with? Have to imagine? Have I to, think. I think. Is that okay? I think we have to reimagine you think? a lot, but also I think we should maybe sometimes move away from the visual and think about the oral culture okay you know and in a way think about what is conversations, conversations. <laughs> I think as a Somali I am pro conversation because we have an oral culture yeah. and we talk way too much we have a practice <laughs> of speaking together yeah. Yeah. whether that is poetic or um, every day and I think in, in, in um, so in a way, by centralizing the eye, we're also reproducing your central yeah. concept of how to engage with the world. So by having that visual element, the archive, yeah. what is there to see, the documentation, and by putting that on number one, it means also we are looking in yeah. through the Eurocentric framework. Yeah. What if you move away from that and think about oral culture? Yeah. What do you think, what about if you learn actually, or you look at what are the stories that are there? Yeah. What can I... And in a way, I mean, histories have been constructions, partly illusionary. They leave out more than they actually True. True. include. Yeah. So it's not a place of inclusion, yeah. the, the way histories have been making. Perhaps yeah. this might be the era where inclusionary form of histories are perhaps a possibility because mm -hmm way more people can go online and yeah, true. write their own shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I also and sing it or tell it, it like, or have, you yeah, know. Yeah, Snapchat it, do yeah. whatever they want yeah. with it. And I think in a way, um, um, as someone who also works a lot with archives and, and I work here at, at the Research Center for Material Culture part-time and I think a lot about like 
what does it um, what does it mean also here in the museum to not, for example, make exhibitions podcasts and use the radio as a format, not necessarily only in the museum, but more outside of the museum. Yeah. Um, and I think um, um, that to me stays or also particularly close to my own heritage, yeah. but it also to me could be potentially a way of documenting um, different forms of Africanness because in various African culture there is oral literature. Yeah, true. And I have to say that was one thing I learned when I studied African studies, African cultural and, and, and languages, African cultures and languages at the University of Leiden. Mm -hmm. That oh, you studied late as well? Yeah, I studied there. Yeah, I did not survive. <laughs> I died. I used to say, I died. <laughs> I get you. But um, I, I do think in a way, uh, um, there, I, one of the most useful things I learned was um, looking into oral literature mm. and how a lot of um, European academics and also African academics yeah. were trying to create make it more valuable or like you know make it like mm -hmm. create rethink also what literature means and what it is mm -hmm. and um and to focus on oral literature yeah. so it literally meant not necessarily writing yeah but looking into spoken yeah. um the mythical the i think uh, i think for me i it deserves because i'm a writer storytelling yeah because yeah. i'm a writer and i'm a burundian writer mm -hmm. and um in terms of, of dissent, mm -hmm. but not necessarily in terms of practice. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting for me, what is sort of a pain of, of a sort of point of sorrow and, and loss, um, but also sometimes it's sort of like I don't have, I feel powerless, mm -hmm. is the realization that Burundian culture and Kurundi language is, is, it is heavily and deeply literary, mm -hmm. right? The culture. You know, like what you said, the, the, the Somali speak in, in Burundi, like Kugiri Jampo, to have a word, to have, to do a speech. It's such an uh, important part of a human being, sort of work, mm -hmm. dignity, uh, ascendancy into becoming mature and becoming wise. You know, like uh, in Burundian culture, to be asked by the family, the, by your family, to be the spokesperson at weddings, funerals, at everything, everybody speeches, yeah. and we have. All kinds of ceremonies in the, our culture that basically are, we're all waiting just for the best speech. We just people will talk for four hours and then do a little wedding. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> just to, that the is wedding funny. part, but the, everything is, is centralized around mm -hmm. the speech. Mm -hmm. jump, jump. Yeah. Like I grew up with kids. Kids when when the party gets to a point where the speeches start, kids are shushed. Kids sit down and are quiet. <laughs> They freeze and they the wait for four starts. or five because the speaking is happening. Yeah. Oh wow! We, yeah. I think we're too non-hierarchical for that. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> in, 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 in Somali culture, what I've always found interesting is the um, speaking. Mm -hmm. and in a way, it's performative. It yeah. is like poetic. It's There's poetic. a lot of poetry. Yeah. Um, I studied um, growing up here. I actually got the opportunity to study Somali at the university. Mm for um, like a one year program. And then it, what I learned was um, that I knew the language, but I didn't know the language as well as I thought mm. I knew the language. Mm. And going to, for example, Hargeisa um, in Somaliland, um, what showed me was I technically knew the language perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and people were super impressed with that. Look at you, diaspora yeah. person, you <laughs> speak the language well. But then there was an old lady that told me, you know the language, but you don't know us. Yeah. And that was very true. Like I couldn't, part of speaking together means that um, stories are attached to people. Yeah. Poetry is attached to people. Proverbs are attached yeah. to people. And to not know the people means you don't understand yeah. how people live yeah. in spoken Sure. Um, and, and that I found was so beautiful because I had to go there a few times in order to be able to speak the game. Yeah. You know, now I know the people, I'm like, okay, I know them, I know that person, <laughs> I know the politics, yeah. but I'm literally incapable of speaking like them. Yeah. And that, that is to me also what it means to be a diaspora. It yeah. means also that you're somehow um, always in in between space, yeah. you're somewhere and nowhere and yeah. there. Part, it part, does, I don't, I, like I somebody told well. me, a, a neutral friend of ours uh, uh, told me that, that uh, and really encouraged me, and I was shocked when they said that I was, it, it took me a day to process that, mm. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. And they talked about how we need to abandon, um, at least he, he, he challenges me to abandon this need to come home. Oh yeah. 
and yeah. and 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 uh, and, uh, and challenge me to really sort of embrace this like in between these mm -hmm. sort of border places that we are at and and that that's a place too that you don't have yeah. to be constantly because I was indeed lamenting in that conversation lamenting the fact that I will never be able at least I would have to really invest so much I would have to go back to Berlin live there for a couple of years mm -hmm. to learn to be an, a, a, a Bruneian speaker yeah. To learn to be able to infuse everything I say with the poetry and the references and the stories, mm -hmm. indeed, the way Burundians do. Like, it's a deeply poetic language, and yeah. everybody, literally, everybody practices all the time yeah. and becoming better at speeching. That's what people want to become. Like, Burundians will listen to the radio, this yeah. is, it's an oral tree culture. People will listen to the radio for like an hour or two for news bulletins in four different languages, and the media reads out everything. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they, like press communicates by yeah. saying, you know, here yeah. they summarize it, like, yeah. oh, the, the, the government said this, yeah. that's it. But no, no, in the Dutch, in Burundian media, they will read everything. People know, and because it's extremely oral, people yeah. need the language, they, they, they hang on to it and develop yeah. it all together. And I sit there and I'm like, I will never get there. And he's like, yeah. and he's like you don't have to get there. You don't have to get there. I think, in a way, the partially also in relation to this. The construction of the African is also about being rooted somewhere, right? Mm. Like, and I think in a way the idea of home is so oppressive yeah. to people. Yeah, because in a way, um, it demands of you to um, to be, to be obsessed or partially connected to belonging, to have mm. this idea of I need to belong somewhere, mm. and. To matter, to be yeah, I think it can be, it can create like, it's quite violent what it does to people. It means that, you know, you have to constantly to also engage with you not belonging there. Mm. And if you, uh, because you think that home is, you know, the end goal. Yeah. But by detaching yourself from that, you free yourself actually. You allow yourself to be that person that is from partially from there and partially from somewhere else and in the between space. I mean, uh, I always uh, quote then um, Edward Clisson, who mm -hmm. writes about de-rooted, mm -hmm. to move away from our collective, as black people, to move away from the co collective obsession with having roots yeah. somewhere. Because being rooted means, I mean, for Caribbean people mm -hmm. or um, people, um, of um, Caribbean and, and, and black people from the Americas, I understand um, it's partially easier mm -hmm. because the continent, they are rooted in many, many different mm -hmm. African cultures. Yeah. But those of us who have a lifeline to one, yeah. um, how do you then rethink also what it means to be de-rooted? Yeah. You know what it means because I personally only went back. What well, I didn't go back because I was never. I, I went back <laughs> for the first time. I didn't even check myself yeah. language-wise because you're so used to saying I'm going back, but I've never been to the place. Yeah. So I've never been to Somali land before. Mm -hmm. um, so what I and I was when I was ready to go was when I could accept that it was not going to be home. See, I made a mistake when I went home because I didn't go back literally uh, because I was born in Burundi, grew up in Burundi. I was nine when we came to the Netherlands. When I was about 22, I went back mm -hmm. the first time. Then I went back when I was about 29 or so. Mm -hmm. Also, longer periods, about a year, a year. Oh, wow. And I think I made a mistake because I went, I went home, literally. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, home has always, I was a sort of promise of safety because mm -hmm. I feel like we're living in a hostile world. Yeah. Especially if you're living in Europe. But black people yeah. around the world are living in a hostile world. Planet. The time. I think it, I read about a book that I heard about a book that they're writing about how black people move to another planet. I like sci-fi. But anyways, but sci-fi is uh, sci-fi. Um, but home has kind of a promise of of finding safety. I think that that's mm -hmm. literally what, especially people in diaspora communities, mm -hmm. like like keep thinking that we mm -hmm. if we get home. And I think I did that. But what I didn't really. But what understand, did you find there? What I found there. Um, I don't know, I think that I went home and I changed home. So mm -hmm. I went back there thinking I was coming home, but in fact I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't respecting home, you right? know? Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I, I came to change it. I had these ideas about mm -hmm. how, you know, uh, I'm going to go there and help and develop the country, you know? And the missionary work. The missionary work. And I went yeah. there, not necessarily coming home, I went there to basically, I don't know, like morphed it into mm -hmm. something that is comfortable to me, right? Yeah. And I found there like layers and layers of complexities and intricacies and relationships that 
I literally had no, eight, one, no understanding of, <laughs> and very little placing, very little positionality. Yeah. yeah. And I look back now, I think about how, for example, you talked about how, um, you talked just about how uh, this ethnographic, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the violence of it all, the sort of erasure, just this concert, this colonial concert, I feel like it's still ongoing. And some of us oh, have really? a lot to do with it. Like if I look at the curriculum, the educational curriculum in Burundi, mm -hmm. it's basically French, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And I see people who are working at these big NGOs, who are Burundian of Burundi mm -hmm. descent, and ministers who are signing off on this. I've met Burundian women and men who are older, who have, who are real poets, who are yeah. literary giants, right? Who think that I, because I can read and write in French and English mm -hmm. and Dutch, I'm a better literary, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm better than they are, you know? Yeah. They send their kids yeah. to schools that don't teach them anything about the land, that don't teach them anything about mm -hmm. uh, how to become a great spoke, uh, speecher or whatever that teach them how to do numbers and how to work computers work behind desks and they think that they're lesser than their children but that's that's why i i always say the colonial administration just never left yeah. the continent yeah. and whether that is in burundi or somalia or wherever you know yeah. and i i think it's there is so much decolonial work that needs to be done yeah. if i think about back um, home as well yeah like I, if i um, there's a thin line, like when I go to Somaliland, for example, I really have to almost contain myself and to, in order to respect yeah. how people think, how they, um, that I can also see the empowering um, and the agency to give that the space. Because mm -hmm. when you're a diaspora person, you're also mentally trained to be a missionary worker. Mm -hmm. There's so many Somalis that are there working for the UN mm -hmm. just to keep us refugees. Yeah. And um, most, I think my parents, well, my, my father didn't have a problem with whatever that I was doing. <laughs> my mother was so much like, you know, um, sometimes um, um, pushed by her friends mm. to almost then um, 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 for her to tell, to ask me, maybe you need to reconsider, maybe you need to work yeah. at, and she didn't even believe in the UN. <laughs> work at the UN because that meant that one is has a position that you arrived as a yeah. diaspora person you know and, and I, I, I think about like what it means for so many of us as diaspora people to go back and set up businesses yeah. like in, in Somaliland what I part one of my largest irritate one of my biggest irritations there was to see so many diaspora people people literally being the new colonizers yeah. you know um, setting up new factories setting up this but really setting up coffee is, shops what setting is it going to do for um, rebuilding the country in a sustainable way in conversation with the local people mm -hmm. that part of the conversation is not there it's no. literally like oh yeah I'm trained at the University of whatever whatever yeah. I'm going to bring you knowledge mm -hmm. what about local knowledge yeah. how can you actually exchange and, and that to me is, is I, I feel in this hyper neoliberal capitalist societies and the ways we are conditioned within these societies, it literally means that that moves, yeah. that conditioning um, is combined with then the colonial conditioning of the local people who have some sort of, um, um, let's say, low self esteem. Yeah. Yeah. Like I would almost say colonial low self esteem. Yeah. Um, by assuming because someone speaks with a British accent and yeah, they have literally exactly. no degree or anything, they have no knowledge, they show up with their British or American accents, that by default they deserve better than someone who's locally Precisely. educated, who yeah. speaks with a yeah. thick, heavy Somali accent, yeah. but who writes perfectly. And, and these type of, to me, that is the everyday colonialism. But the, my question is that, because I notice this, like, okay, so I feel what you're saying stands in sharp contrast to the fact that I hear so many uh, uh, continental Africans or Africans who are living here now, but mm -hmm. first generation, who have actually mm -hmm. lived in Burundi or something, yeah. and, and they keep talking about how in, in back home there is no blackness, back home I am, uh, we're this and this and that, yeah. but, but what you're describing is the condition of blackness around the world. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, it's definitely the condition of it, but to a degree I'm, I'm more of that and at the same time acknowledging that um, in particular countries where everyone is black, mm -hmm. um, we always have to remember what is the construction of blackness as well. Mm -hmm. I think. But in the, colonial, blackness, in the colonial dynamics. I mean, in the colonial dynamics, now we are the foot soldiers of 
colonialism. Mm -hmm. Like I sometimes say, you know, women are the foot soldiers of patriarchy, mm -hmm. um, and queer and trans yeah. <laughs> women, I, I include them too. Mm -hmm. But I think in 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 specifically speak about Somali or other other African societies. Um, if I look at it, like we are definitely yeah. like the foot soldiers of Cologne. Like we don't, there, there's no white officers that is around no. to keep these school educational systems the same. Yeah. And if I look at across the well, continent, there, there is the white World Bank and UN. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> and they've been around for a long time, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and they benefit. They yeah. best, they live their best lives, yeah. I think, yeah. on the continent, yeah. across the continent. But specifically, you know, what does it also mean for the sustainable? sustainability of lives and resources but also of nature environment mm -hmm. um, in particular countries like um, Somalia um, or and Somaliland I should say where people are living also in an ecological time bomb yeah you know sure. and um, and for me to then walk around and to see all these things at the same time, I find that sometimes I can only handle to go there for two weeks. Okay, and yeah. intense, I'm working with people, I, like I'm, um, I'm interviewing people, having conversations, but it's so intense that I can only do it for a particular amount of time and then I need to move into my own self again. Yeah. Um, but it also means that some conversations I can't have yet. Yeah. Like uh, we almost have to... Um, um, I have to find local people that think similar mm -hmm. in order to have those conversations because I also feel it's not my place mm -hmm. um, to then do the missionary work. Yeah. I'm not there to, I'm, I'm there to be in dialogue all the time, yeah. but I'm not there to come there and go like, you know what? Y'all need bell hooks in your life. Or exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need, have you, you not need read to read Glowing no, no, What? What do you, you know, need Someone needs to translate Glowing <laughs> in Somali right now. <laughs> It's, it's not but then, but then I wonder because I think I'm just just yeah, thinking yeah, out yeah. loud right now. I'm thinking I'm hearing you talk and then I'm like, okay, so a lot of these issues, not all of them, but a lot of these issues have sort of you know the West and the, as as a as a as a locality as well, but also as a concept, as a concept, as a, as a dominating influence on the world has been emanating, ri like rippling with with its power, with its influence, with its hard cash and its yeah. violence yeah. has been, but also with its academia yeah. has been sort of rippling around the world, and it's sort of it, this, this, I, I, and I wonder, do we not have to focus? Yeah. on here first or something oh definitely and fight the fight here yeah, you know and have these discussions here before we go or maybe it's at the same time i, I don't think you know need to, you need to do it at the same time but then i'm also pro you know over there maybe they need to read nuguki or mm. uh nuruddin farah you know they need yeah. to read like or or some of the po female poets there are many others like i shouldn't have also to, you know, <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I love I love her literature. I have to say. Did you I, not think that Americana was particularly anti-black? No, I thought Americana was a, a upper class Nigerian woman. Um, yeah. You know, and the thinking that comes along. I wouldn't say it's anti-black. I think it's more. It's a class. I felt it was a class yeah. thing, and that creates a hierarchy. Uh, I, mean, I think sometimes we should remember among black people, class is a thing. thing yeah. And and um, and the lives we get to live is so much when class is around, and and you know patriarchy. These mm. two are toxic, toxic together. Yeah. And and I think some. I think there. I mean now there's quite a thing of calling black people anti-black, but sometimes I'm like we need to actually think about what they what are they doing? Mm. What is their toxicness? Because yeah. to call someone anti-black as a black person also denies their own blackness and how messy it is you know it's it's i think it is sometimes often it is a class when you're black people amongst each other mm. you know to also take away someone's blackness how fucked up it is yeah um true it's a problem because then you're reproducing yeah. the same thing while they might be reducing you because of a class thing or patriarchy or some power stuff but part of me wants to say to people or who are not people, or whatever. part of me wants to say people black people who are not pro-queer yeah i don't want to call them pro-black 
Because I am literally existing within yeah. blackness. How can you say that I am I, not I, I think part of that? Of black people because they are indeed not pro all black people. Right? So they're just pro themselves. They and I think that they go like I want to see myself, and that's what I want as blackness. Yeah. Which is and very I think, narrow, I think I think um, that what they're doing thing. also by doing that, they're also literally making blackness so small, very small. that I think that they're violating. They're actually inflicting violence on blackness. If they're gonna narrow it down. And narrow down, shape it to this, mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. tiny little um, fragment of all of human realities yeah. and human experience. Yeah. What what are we what are you doing to it? it I mean, I mean, exclusionary. This, this is this is another problem I think where what you spoke about earlier about you know um, there are so many Africans in their religiosity mm. are homophobic yeah. and they're queer, anti queer and anti trans and sometimes trans is even gets to pass uh, but yeah. it's difficult because it depends on if the trans person is passing or not yeah. but um, and it's something very like it's something that we need to that as Africans of the diaspora or not really need to deal with that yeah. but we also need to think about in what context are we dealing with it yeah. like you know um, for example in Muslim societies it's such a complex thing to talk about um, like black Muslim societies yeah. to you know people need to find a language for it to kind of call it out deal with it but also be constructive in the ways we we actually engage with calling it out yeah um, and at the same time um, we also have to acknowledge that it's complex and layered like yeah. I when I was in Hargeza I, I was literally the ignorant person because mm. that's where I learned it was like we were with a friend there and he's queer and I did not understand the codes. I couldn't see the codes. Like I couldn't, you know. And he told me about words that they use yeah. and the ways. And all of a sudden, it became super visible. Yeah. And it just meant that because I'm not, again, not like a, I'm not a local person. I didn't understand the lingua franca mm -hmm. that was needed in order to like maneuver um, and to understand what my friends meant as an ally, as a friend. Um, Wait, and are also you, to hear. Are you trained in not an like, anthropologist? No, I'm not. You did African studies. Yeah, but then I'm not trained as an. Oh, I just okay. did. I would say I'm just more of an, um, a generalist. Okay, because I need your advice on something. <laughs> I'm struggling with something. How much time do we have left over? Uh, eight minutes. Eight oh, minutes. Wow. Okay, this is like, yeah, this goes really fast. It's ridiculous. Fast. Yeah, one so many topics went like. Mm. <laughs> but we did stick mostly to the African question. But we need to. We realize we need to go because you just started opening up a whole new can yeah. of worms, like Islamophobia and, and, and in black in black communities and exactly. and, and, and anti blackness in Muslim. I mean, that's a whole. That's okay. the anti blackness in in, in, in Muslim. Well, I didn't talk about the anti blackness. No. instead about the queerness it, and homophobia. Yeah. But let me ask something because I'm struggling with something. I'm writing actually right now an article for One World, and I'm struggling with. Um, and it has to do with also what uh, uh, Professor Oyeronka does in her work, where she unearths and excavates and lays yeah. bare yeah. the kind of ways in which the, ge the, the gendered white gaze mm -hmm. has somehow warped and shaped how we understand traditional Yoruba culture. Oh, and how, yeah, and how, and she, the book is called The Invention of Women. Okay. In the second book, she talks about how men, black men, Nigerian mm -hmm. men, to Nigerian scholars, mm -hmm. have been complicit mm -hmm. in further embedding this idea of gender as two categories that are, that actually lead to uh, 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 that sort of like um, they're sort of embedding this construct mm -hmm. of women being lesser, inferior, mm -hmm. and so on, slowly into Yoruba culture by Nigerian scholars, mm -hmm. right, male scholars, and I am I am thinking a lot about LGBTQIAP mm -hmm. as a construct. These identities that we're calling them identities now are not necessarily new. This idea of sexual and gender mm -hmm. diversity mm -hmm. around the world is like is part of human human history, right? Mm -hmm. But around the world people have developed different ways of looking at it, mm -hmm. different ways of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Burundi we don't have a word for gay. But mm -hmm. we don't have a word for straight either, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the behavior itself mm -hmm. of having sex with people with the same gender mm -hmm. is not elevated to an identity. No. It's not considered it's as like... Yeah, you it's just something that people do. Mm -hmm. It's just... Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get married. You might mm -hmm. still get married, have children, because mm -hmm. that's expected, because that has to do with becoming mm -hmm. wise, becoming an important part mm -hmm. of them. But who you have sex with, no one really... Mm -hmm. It's not... It has never been something... It's not an identity position. 
It's not an identity word. And I think that the fact that it hasn't been named in Burundian culture mm -hmm. is actually a strategy of inclusivity. Yeah. It's a linguistic and sort of mm -hmm. philosophical strategy yeah. that allows the inclusion of behavior mm -hmm. and doesn't necessarily puts it outside. No, I, right? I, I so. And says, oh, well, these, these yeah. people, what are they? They're a whole species. We're going to call them gays. We're going to call them whatever. They're just these people that do things, mm -hmm. right? And, and you see, for example, and I'm, it's really complicated, I think. I, we see, for example, in Burundi that I was talking to people who were like, um, I was talking about like, yeah, I'm interested in dudes, and they're like, yeah. why do you all have to call yourself gay? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, you know, everybody does that when they're younger. Like every, but, and they, they call it gufumbatana. Gufumbatana is this practice of literally, like the image that I have is being in a, a, on the land or something, in the forest or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're very cold, and you, you're together, and you get close to one another mm -hmm. to stay warm, mm -hmm. and you like, hold, you, you hug each other. Mm -hmm. but, there's a very active element to that. Mm. To go fumbatana. <laughs> there's a doing oh, <laughs> of things. Of things. That can, must not be disclosed. That must not be disclosed. I mean, because everybody does it. Like, <laughs> and people make jokes about that. Yeah. Hmm, you people must have been go uh, fumbatana like uh, last oh, week, weren't you? Like when you're all up. You know, the sort of. But no one, mm -hmm. until now, there's this whole wave mm -hmm. of ideological and political progress mm -hmm. coming where these organizations where yeah. queer people from this diaspora yeah. are coming and saying these are gay people these are trans yeah. people these are this yeah and communities uh, are being exposed yeah. people individuals are being exposed themselves. and they have yeah. to position themselves like a few years ago i was in burundi i met trans people i call them trans but i don't know if i should call them trans people mm -hmm. because they were living lives as uh, I then representing in the way that they want very feminine. So they weren't yeah. calling themselves trans women. Oh, they weren't calling themselves was... trans femme. But they were like having their hair did, makeup, yeah. going out, and, you know, like mm -hmm. nails. Like where you're like, whoa, right? Mm -hmm. And quite known. One of them is a young girl that I, trans girl that I know, was 16, 17 when I met her. I mean, she was known in Bujumbura as being the funnest. If you start a club, if you start a party, and she wasn't yeah. there, your party's shit. No one will come. So yeah. people would like. Companies and bars would pay her to come to oh, the party because you know what I mean? She's like, because she's the fun. Mm -hmm. Now, though, in five years' time, in just five years' time, wow. she's become the target of political persecution and aggression. Wow. And in five years' time, when I met her five years ago, she was like, "Why would I? Why would I cut this? Why would I change that? Why would I?" No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm going. Good. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. She really is like, oh, yeah. "You need about Zungu. That's for white people." Yeah. The whole man women shit is for white people, right? So even gender binaries for herself mm -hmm. was something completely mm -hmm. And now she's talking about getting hormones. Now she's talking in five years time wow. She That's sees herself. She has redefined herself as a trans woman mm -hmm. and I don't know whether we're not keep on sort of with this language of LGBT which is quite westernized mm -hmm. whether yes. we're not somehow yeah. Culturally, like cultural imperialism, when we're not perpetuating that again. I think in all things we are perpetuating that. Don't you think that? I mean, um, that was a long intro to a question. Wasn't it? <laughs> just, I mean, it's an interesting intro as well because what it allow, what it makes me think about is also the um, been doing this project here in the museum about it's called un unengendering the collection mm. and it's looking into the collection to see what types of how gender classifications are made by um, um, literally constructed by the institution mm. um, and classified so mm. for example people would write the classification um, text and mm. say this is a man or a woman exactly. You know that is a Eurocentric. It was a Eurocentric concept, and it still is a Eurocentric concept. And often, throughout maybe a hundred years, it was never changed or questioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there are, for example, particular cultures. Um, there are maybe eight or nine gender positions. Mm. There are like known particular exactly. cultures. There are, you know, there is known third genders. Yeah. Um, and there are other cultures where the gender is not even like so. No. Um, intensely in, in the language yeah. and constructed in the language. In Kurundi, we don't have a he or she. I mean, that is an interesting thing, though. No? Yeah. Like, what does it mean when languages leave out, what you actually said before, what, when the languages leave out the positions people mm -hmm. have to take as 
yeah. gender as gender people yeah. and does that mean that in that culture there is no concept of um, or the concept of gender is not considered important enough in to that, be yeah. conceptualized yeah. because language is often um, kind of the limit in the you know of, of our world yeah. like what we know and how we can say it yeah. is what we can actually see yeah. um, and, and that I, I yes yeah, it's, it's a complex thing because in the Western con context I understand why there are all these gender positions because gender is such a clear and historically constructed mm. um, socially constructed concept um, but not universally so not, not universally yeah not the world has been has gone through colonialism mm. col colonization and lives in the afterlives of that and slavery yeah. which means that you know and the renewed kind of work that let's say particular Arab imperialism, the Christian imperialism that is happening, and yeah. what what does that do to like particular concepts of gender? Yeah. And that's to me doesn't surprise me. Like all of a sudden, um, what changed in those five years? What did did the funding years? change of the missionaries? Could be, yes. Did you know? Um, did the Caitlyn Jenner's change? Or <laughs> we live also in a global world where um, violence, you know, moves around. Yeah. True. When people are violated, in particular, like everyone has internet now. Everyone. I think has it has. I think um, social media. That's why I'm trying to be very careful what I because I have a lot of yeah. people from Africa who follow me, like who, yeah. who are like gender non-conforming, queer, queer yeah. like whatever, and I get scared because I think Facebook has had a particularly strong mm -hmm. impact on how we're thinking about queer identities and gender mm -hmm. identities as well. Mm -hmm. Facebook is is able to take things that are coming from the West mm -hmm. and massively sending it out in the world, mm -hmm. and there's no going back. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and because you know just the algorithms and mm -hmm. the, the sheer uh, output. Who has the ability, production capabilities of keep on making little videos about this is what LGBT means? Who gets to do that? Who has the time and the money and the reach? Mm -hmm. It's not the Africans, <laughs> you know. They don't have to. They receive. They just keep receiving and being told this is what. And I think, anyways. Um, this is how you position yourself. Yeah. This is what you need to call yourself. Yeah, it's 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 a um, a complex. It's a very complex thing. But I also then I also think about like um, collectives like Strange Fruits yeah. and Friends and how they here did even actually here as a queer collective were very much about being inclusive by not pushing the closet mm. out of the closet yeah. people did not have to be out of the closet exactly. they can be just whatever yeah. they can walk in as a drag or as a trans yeah. or as a um, queer man or whatever yeah. and walk out as someone else, yeah, someone else back into society yeah. and I think those type of spaces um, allow all types of different forms or these type of you know mm. platforms allow different forms to be especially in a, in a, in a place like here where um, the the out of the closet politics is real. Like it's, it's really, oppressive. Yeah, it's very oppressive. If I think about some people, it's complex. I um, wait. We have four minutes. We have four, four minutes. minutes. Wait, wait, no. no, you've been like. Oh, we're over four, four minutes. Over like <laughs> five, <laughs> oh. six minutes. Okay, then we. Maybe. Listen, no. I just realized I forgot something. Normally, yeah. I always have some text. Yeah. to like I will ask the people that I'm asking to speak mm -hmm. to either read a text to me at the end or I will read a text to them mm -hmm. last time I did it before because it was so poignant but I forgot to ask you mm. so I think we don't have, we don't really have a wrap up we don't really have a good wrap wrapping up mm. except for ta-da <laughs> that sounds good I'm gonna thank you for this amazing conversation it's oh, been thank you so much it's been it's really like really fun it's just the beginning we it's have so beginning. many <laughs> So interesting. Uh, I hope I don't know whether did you had did you did you did you enjoy it? Was it yeah. okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it was really nice. I know we can see your work. It, it reminded me to to really think a bit more about think more and maybe start writing about some of the things I've been thinking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and or you know, speak it out in the pod podcast. Or, or speak it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then I don't like talking by myself. It's uh, more enjoyable in conversation. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so interested in you know the the single authorship. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I'm gonna give the, you a hug, and they're gonna the shut everything up. Off. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Love you, sexy outfit. <laughs> you bang on the 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 yeah, outfit. <laughs> 
I do not know what pants love it and hear what they're about. I don't understand why yeah. do people wear those. I don't understand. Oh, so sick. If you are gonna wear shorts, you're gonna wear shorts. No shorts on me. I mean I understand pants because it's cold. Oh, okay. But shorts longer than here? I don't know. Dumb bar. Dumb here. Yeah. Oh my god, Hilarious. But it's a pin dumb. I'm a bit of a little bit. Ik heb echt hard op hier en dat vond ik al intens. Ik zeg al, maak altijd een grapje, het is de hashtag Haram Life. 